Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dead to Me, the only Walking Dead podcast with the guts to start at season 10. I am your host, Johnny O'Dell. With me, as always, podcast producer Alexander August and Skybound Games producer Woody Tondorf. Guys, how are you doing? Ah, oh, I'm. You know what? I'm. I'm a little. I'm a little melancholy today, Johnny. Oh, it, you know. I think I know why. Alexander, how are you doing? Something feels missing. Something feels missing. Yeah, I feel it. So, um, just as a quick programming note for everyone, we are going to be. We have now completed our Talk Dead to Me reanimated slate. We have gone through each season, found iconic episodes, talked to amazing guests. And we've come to an end to that. So now we are going to transition the podcast while we're still in hiatus and going forward into sort of an interview only format where I will still be around and we'll probably still hear from Woody and Alexander from time to time in fun different ways that I'll think of later. And mostly it's just going to be an interview show where you'll hear a quick intro from me. I'll interview a guest that you know. And then do a quick outro and that's it but you know we have a lot of fun surprises coming um it's going to be sad to see this version of the podcast go i think it'll crop up because we've recorded episodes for the season 10 finale and some world beyond so you'll probably hear it again in some form or another but that is the news for that canceled canceled we are we are canceled congratulations suits and or haters you did it but you know what I'm, I'm stabbing out a cigarette as I say this. You know, I, I'm, I'm finishing like a half-finished bottle of whiskey like Shane in right. the shower. You know what? Mm. We're we're taking our time today, this week. Yeah. I don't care that Johnny has to edit the podcast. I wow. am getting out of this podcast booth, <laughs> kicking and screaming. I will say all the things that I want to say. The hottest of takes, straight fire takes are coming today. So you know Can't what? Wait. Buckle, buckle the fuck up. I will say it is kind of apropos that we are going out on Comic-Con weekend. I mean that is that is a really nice yes that's a really that's a really nice tie off really nice end date and just to clarify guys this podcast will still keep happening on Sunday nights as far as I know and it'll also exist in video form on YouTube so this will still be happening don't unsubscribe or anything keep keep liking and you know it, it'll it'll be a fun journey to go on I, I'm excited to see where it's going you know what what I do when I feel sad is I brush it right under the rug, just right under there. You lift open the rug, you brush it under, and you're like, bury it, bury it deep, Johnny. As Alexander mentioned, we had Comic Con this weekend, or at least virtual Comic Con. Basically, everyone got to see all the Hall H panels they wanted to without having to wait outside in a long line for four days while they starve or get stabbed in the eye with a pencil. Some quick news uh, that came out this weekend with the Walking Dead panels. The Walking Dead season 10 finale finally has a release date. That date is October 4th. That's a Sunday at 9 p.m. We're finally going to see the finale. We got to see the opening minutes um, in a clip that they released, uh, more extended opening minutes. We finally got to see the Horde, and it looks a lot better than when we first saw it. Yeah, it turns out it's a lot more intimidating uh, than seeing an image that's just like uh, 60 extras and white aerial font with walkers. Yeah. 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 Also that night, October 4th, uh, immediately following The Walking Dead season 10 finale is going to be uh, the series premiere of Walking Dead World Beyond. So that'll be really fun. That'll be a good way to get fans into that show. I think it has a pretty strong pilot. And so hopefully that's enough to grab fans. And then starting the following week, it's going to be World Beyond with Fear the Walking Dead. It's going to be Fear at 9, World Beyond at 10, and they're just going to go back to back for about eight weeks, and then World Beyond's going to have their finale by itself a week later. So I feel like nostalgic yeah, about The Walking Dead coming back in a way I never have before. Yeah. God, let's let's hope our attention is on The Walking Dead and like what's going on with those two shows when we get to the end of November <laughs> and December. Yeah. Woody, before we get into more of it, uh, can you give me a quick like three-word description of what you thought about the Fear Season 6 trailer? It was great. Okay. And so now we're going to go on to the next piece of news, which is that this was shocking to me. I learned this like a day before the news actually dropped, that The Walking Dead is adding six additional episodes to season 10. The finale, as far as I know, the finale is still a finale. The six other episodes are just quote unquote extra, and they will have no impact on season eleven. What do you guys think this means? My my mindless speculation is that they they are basically like, well, it's kind of like the apocalypse out there, and nobody's going outside. So like, if we just send camera crews to a few of like, let, let's just go to like uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan's ranch or whatever, and just have him like walk around like Negan and be like, well, this is this is what it's like right before the apocalypse kicks off or something like that. I don't know if it's like. Lost style flashbacks yeah. where it's like not pre-apocalypse, but it's like 
right as it's kicking off, but everything's not like totally doom and gloom. I, I do not know what they have planned. There's so little time that elapsed in the last few episodes, the last half, the back half of season 10, that I can't see where they would sandwich in more plot that wouldn't be like kind of oddly overblown and undermine the story that season 10 told. So I'm just, yeah, I kind of, I like flashbacks makes a lot of sense and it's kind of, that's super intriguing if there was a way they could pull it off, but I'm def- I'm definitely flummoxed and intrigued. I would imagine you could do something with where Connie's been. Um, obviously, Magna's returned. You could do something where Magna's been. That's a good point. If That's Connie's true. still alive, That's true. I forgot about it. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll find out soon enough. We sure um, will. Just some uh, two more pieces of information. Comes as no surprise, but season 11 has been pushed uh, to 2021. And then also, uh, we had some fun news that Woody would be excited about because he's more of an Invincible fan than us. As we said last week, uh, Invincible, the animated series based on Robert Kirkman's superhero comic, uh, which is really funny and great. They cast uh, six more characters, all from The Walking Dead. Um, just going to go through them really quick. Lauren Cohen is going to play War Woman. Excellent. Chad L. Coleman is going to play Martian Man. Fantastic. Michael Cudlitz as Red Rush. Love it. Lenny James as Darkwing. Lenny Hold James as Darkwing is fucking galaxy brain shit. I love that. Keep going. Russ Marquand as the Immortal and Aquarius. Top notch. And finally, Sonequa Martin-Green as Green Ghost. So Love it. Oh my God. This is this is great. I mean... I think that means we have to start calling her Sonequa Martin-Green Ghost. Perfect. Nailed it. Okay. 10 out of 10. 40 minutes in. We're finally ready to get into this episode. <laughs> uh, as I said, we are covering Season 9, Episode 5, What Comes After, Rick's last episode, very emotional, uh, directed by Greg Nicotero, written by Scott M. Gimple and Matthew Negret. Uh, Matthew Negret, of course, is the showrunner for Walking Dead World Beyond, so we got all the heavy hitters here. Uh, what, do you, what, what do the good people have to look forward to in this uh, you know, quasi-final version of this podcast? In this in this semi-final episode, first of all, let me say uh, to to all of the returning uh, listeners and or viewers, excellent. You you folks really every week we got out of bed. We we're like, why do we do this goddamn show? And we thought of you guys. And a couple of you in the comments would say nice things. And we're like, let's 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 put it on one more time. And, and we really appreciate you. You're really great. Uh, this has been this has been such a journey. Uh, you're clearly here for the interviews, and we get that. But you know what? This is for the, for the time this journey's been going on. It's been it's been nice. And for new people, wow! You know you um you either came. You can always go back neck. to the archives. Yeah, look, there's more. There's there's 37 other episodes. I would say half of which are okay. Uh, so you how know, dare you? Do with that as you will. What are we gonna do today? It's, it's winners and losers uh, who had the best and worst performances in the episode. Uh, I'll have a little bit of dunked on for singular moments of physical and or emotional abuse uh, beset on one particular character or concept or thing. <laughs> uh, then we'll do the glorious return. It has come back into the harbor. It is the world famous and locally semi-popular ship watch boat Ooh. sounds. <laughs> Can't wait. Uh, we, we, we examine friendships, uh, relationships, uh, the weird spatial relationships, well, whatever we want, really. Uh, yeah. And then uh, it's Alexandra's least favorite uh, segment. It's my favorite one. Johnny is ambivalent. We'll, we'll see where it goes. It's a pocket tips. Uh, hey. Maybe Johnny finds somewhere in one of his external hard drives the goddamn music for the segment. <laughs> maybe Not for likely. the final episode. Who knows? If it's in, if it's in your, your heart and minds, Johnny, you know, try, try to do it. My uh, heart, it's, then, it's in my heart drive. In your... <laughs> Bring in, bring in fire stuff today, Johnny. This is this is excellent. Uh, and then we like so we've got special guest uh, Pollyanna McIntosh, aka Anne slash Jadis, who is uh, not is a us. Mac computer. She is a person who played Jadis in The Walking Dead. Eleven out of ten, perfect Thank stuff. You. And uh, and then after that interview, if there's still time, and you know what, God damn it, there will be time because it's it's Alexandra in my last episode. Uh, Stray arrows. We're just going to yeah. tell you whatever the fuck was on our minds. We're going to ask you what's your wound. It's going to be great. All right. Let's start us off with winners and losers. You don't get a theme song anymore. <laughs> what do you swear to God? It's the last fucking episode. If you don't give me a theme <laughs> song, right. I am that was, firing that's you. That's not the take. That's not, that's, that's bad. <laughs> some people are winning. Some people are losing. But it's The Walking Dead, so everyone turns. Yeah. My winner this week is emotional manipulation. Look. The writers, uh, who are, as I mentioned, Scott Gimple and Matthew Negrette, they are really good at crafting this episode. We, we know it's Rick's last episode. They advertised it as such, like, months ahead of time, and everyone goes in knowing that, which is interesting, because usually they don't advertise someone's exit or someone's major death. It just kind of surprise happens. So they drag it out all episode in, in, in very interesting and clever ways. 
And like even at the end with Michonne and Daryl and everyone rushing the bridge, I just rewatched the React video that we made for it and everyone's cheering and celebrating and hugging and jumping up and down. And at the end of that React video, everyone's like, man, I'm done with this show. <laughs> like, it, it is pretty trying on the fans. And I That's, do yeah. kind of feel That's bad for them. That is the correct reaction to the end of that episode. Oh, I totally yeah. disagree. Oh my God. I watched this when I was reviewing the show for CBR. So I got it like four days before it aired. And it was one of, it was one of those, one of the few times that that is not cool, but just kind of annoying because I can't process this emotionally with anyone. And I remember just thinking like, wow, this is a really sad episode. I'm sorry that Andy Lincoln is leaving. And it seems like it's definitely going to, what the fuck? And I was completely caught off guard by that. <laughs> I am definitely less emotionally attached to The Walking Dead and what happens on it than a lot of fans are, given I just kind of came to it as a, as a circuitous route. And it's has a professional, I have to deal with it in some to some extent professionally. But I like I really liked that Rick was still around and that it was going to go off. And I love that they used um, that Wang Chong song and called back to the pilot. I thought it was such a good left turn because nobody thought, like I remember being on a press trip for that, um, the press visit for that season and not one person in the reporter pool, I think except for me, thought Rick was going to live. They were like, oh, well, he's obviously dying. There's no way to get rid of Andy Lincoln and not kill him off this show because there's no way Rick's character would have voluntarily left his family. But when they find that reason to have him go, and like, I'm stepping on, I think, your, your future winner, Alexandra, but like, for that approach, it just feels so mercenary. Like a, well, like we know that Rick Grimes is a big character. It would naturally make story sense to have this guy die because that's what would happen within this world. But we have, we've had the feeling that we want to keep the Walking Dead franchise going. So let's hold on to him to potentially use him in like in movies. And that just mm. feels like a, like, mm. and that was the yeah. solution that you got to. It just sucked. I, I just, I didn't like, the way that they got there and all that, like, I don't think that there were any great routes to go to, like, to continue that on. So, like, they did the best they could with it. But even then, like, it just didn't hit for me. And I think the reaction of, like, all the fans, like, tells you something. Like, nobody, nobody liked Oh, that. wow. Wait, so nobody liked that he lived or nobody liked the episode? Oh, people were thrilled that he lived. And they're very excited well, about the Rick yeah, movies. But, they will literally yeah. not ever stop talking about it on social media. But, um... Yeah, I don't know. Rick's last episode, I mean, there's way more controversial death episodes or, or I guess, characters leaving episodes. It, they're they're hard to do. And I feel like Walking Dead always tries to make it super this, extra. Well, I feel like it could have been a more normal my one, episode. Yeah, like, that was my but, one um, kind of complaint about this episode is that it's a little bit, it leans into Rick leaving and needing to like make a monument out of him from every different angle. And it's like, we, we already like Rick as a character, guys. And I already like, I don't need right. to see him. He basically like hasn't, it, it was exhausting to watch him struggle for over an hour. And it was, I love the payoff was to me was, was I, I liked because it was a relief of that. But yeah, I was also like, okay, Jesus Christ. For them, sometimes it's hard with the like super big characters to rip the bandaid yeah. off. They really yeah. don't like doing it. They like to slowly take it off. We saw it with Carl. Carl should have just died and that was the end of it. But we had a whole mid season premiere where he's just sitting there dying and everyone gets to say goodbye to him. And it's fine. I, I I can't watch that episode. It's it's not enjoyable for me to watch. I don't like that episode. I think that my frustration with it is mostly in the like the the first four episodes of season nine are excellent. And like once you get to like season nine, they really turn the corner from where they were with season seven and eight. And and I honestly like I'm I'm a big fan of where season nine and, and season yeah. ten have gone. There are realities that you have to face in television production that you don't face anywhere else. Like you have actors who are doing the same role and essentially like living within the same universe that's changing and like growing to some degree. But like by season seven, they've been doing this for eight years plus. They want to do something else. It eventually gets boring for the actors. It happens on every TV show. And then you get these characters who are like, hey, I would like to leave and go do some things. But at the same time, you realize this is a very valuable property, especially with The Walking Dead. They're like, well, Andrew Lincoln is the beating heart of this whole like franchise. He can't, we can't really let him go and do whatever he wants. Like to a degree we should free him up, but like, can we still hold on to you to call you for these movies? And so you just like, you just go and make it work. I'm not trying to be too hard on like the showrunners and the writers who had a very difficult task to accomplish here. It's I just, tough. I don't think they totally stuck the landing and maybe they just didn't have time for whatever reason, but it's just one of the, it just sticks out because the season nine was starting so great 
And then you get into that yeah. and it's kind of like, oh, it's a stutter step. Now it's a time jump. Okay, let's see where it goes. Yeah, I, I don't hate this episode. I think it's just, it just doesn't feel, yeah, you're right. It doesn't fit in with the rest of the season really at all. It's it's strange, but you know, it's, uh, my quick loser and dunked on would be uh, Rick uh, by the hands of Shane, who um, couldn't help but being a dick in his own uh, hallucination in his own sort of fever dream where he said, uh, how's my girl doing? That that was that was probably Oof. the highlight of the episode Oof. for me outside of seeing Scott Wilson. Oh, I mean, John I mean, Bernthal is like so fucking good. Rick has PTSD, like PTSD. Or also secretly in love and, with Shane. Um, anyway. Post-traumatic he- Shane disorder? Ah, I mean, <laughs> shit, probably. Wow. That's wow. a thing. I think we can wrap up the podcast. Thank you guys so much. Happy birthday to Nate. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> let's go on to you, Woody. Uh, who are your winners and losers slash dunked on? Uh, big, big winners for the episode uh, are the Walkers. Oh, yeah. This episode, they 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 were like, you know what, guys? Enough is fucking <laughs> enough. Let's get, let's get a whole big group before there's a whole horde in a future episode or a season. Let us track down this dude. I see that he's like stuck on the rebar. He's going to get on a horse. Fuck it. We're following the horse. Let's go all the way down the road. Okay. He veered off into like some like side path. Like, you know what? The, the walkers are so smart in this episode. When he has the uh, the wake up bit with Shane in the hunting lodge or the hunting cabin, and all the walkers are suddenly there, and I'm like, did they? The horse got a pretty good beat on him. Like these walkers are tracking. I realize that's a large horde, but like <laughs> a significant portion of the walkers were like, I bet he went this way, and it was just yeah. they have their day. They get to the bridge, and then they cross the bridge, <laughs> and you see Rick have this moment of like, God fucking damn it, the bridge. I was we really, made too good of a bridge. Holding. I was really hoping the saviors were going to fuck this thing up. Like, ah, oh, god damn it. Oh, my bridge has worked. My symbolic <laughs> bridge is now my end. Yeah. Uh, Honestly, I think I think it was really nice of that one walker to knock over that box of dynamite so Rick could like <laughs> spot that and quickly yeah. formulate a plan. That was really nice. The, the, the last one that he shoots, by the way, I, I mentioned this in my notes, like does a little bit extra where she falls on him and then she puts a little like half roll onto him, like post post oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> to like keep him pinned. And I'm like, well done, actor. Like you've you've done the stunt work on this properly. Woody, who's your loser slash dunked on? But my loser for the episode is uh, is Daryl. Um, oh. He has he has a tough one. He gets there. Poor Daryl. Um, and he does, my, my dunked on are the first like four or five walkers who are like, finally, I'm going to get to bite Rick. And then Daryl <laughs> headshots them from a bajillion miles away across a yeah. river up <laughs> at the bridge. Like Daryl, I would, after watching this, I was like between like, who's the greatest marksman in like the walking dead or like the, in the post-apocalypse world, like right now, I would guess that like, oh, John it's Dory. probably Daryl, but John is probably, I mean, John split a bullet. Yeah. on an axe head that Dwight was holding <laughs> yeah. to kill two walkers at the same time. So it's probably John. But, like, Dwight is, like... John from Fear I'm, the Walking Dead, by the way, for those of you who are like, who? Which is which is a superior Wild West uh, superhero <laughs> show that uh, will uh, uh, happen in uh, October. It's great. Check also it with nukes. Uh, but, like, Daryl, like, has incredible accuracy there and just absolutely snipes. Like, he has the best shots of his life in that scene. And then he gets rewarded for it by watching his, like best buddy leader mentor slash buddy cop who he ran circles around with jesus mm-hmm. um and watch him blow himself up and he's like he's so Single effective tear. by it he's like i he like yeah oh my god and for daryl to cry like that's yeah a, like that's like, yeah you know some shit happened when daryl cried it was such a split second shot i was like why did you cut to norman reed oh that's why okay yep i would probably do less crying and more searching but um <laughs> i get it you know i also yeah because i would be like i don't know rick was like kind of at the the end of that bridge. Well, like, I, we I like that though because it, it, you and you believe that like the emotional stakes are real for everyone who saw. It's like okay, everyone saw that and did not think there was a single way that you could survive. Didn't think that that was possible except for maybe Michonne. And so you kind of it's it allowed it allows us as audience members to believe everyone in Alexandria kind of moving on from Rick and being successful at it and. Um, then that kind of under then when Michonne like finds his boots again, you're like, oh shit! Like it's kind of I don't know, yeah. Real quick, Daryl does mention, or he he has a reaction to that explosion, being like, well, I guess I'll be a hermit for six years and get a dog. But he he does mention <laughs> later on that like he searched the river, he never found a body. Uh, yeah. So oh yeah, that's so right. So there was that. Like, 
But I guess he like does he regret a little bit like trudging off into like the distance. He's like, nah, maybe I should go search for Rick. Yeah. Well, he didn't find a body because they all left, and they're like, well, he's dead. See you later. And then you know, Rick gets taken away, and then they come back to yeah. Anyway, Alexander, who are your winners and losers? Uh, my winner this week is Jadis, who completed yes. her redemption arc with a bang. Like, ooh. I don't know. I actually went back and forth on Jadis as a character just in general. Um, at first, I was like, mm. who are these like weird extra garbage people like this is just like what happened to hipsters after the post-apocalypse they all moved into a garbage dump (laughs) and got really snotty and elitist and changed the length like yeah um but then you know towards after and i kind of just wrote them off as being a little too cartoonish for me but then once when simon kills them all and she has to put them all in a meat grinder uh paulina mcintosh is extremely talented at that uh just for some reason kind of wound got me interested in that character and it was ultimately very sad to watch her this season just be um be more or less shunned and not really um not really embraced by the people she was trying to live with and be very lonely and so um I care way more about Rick than I care about Jadis but it was really um I liked that we might of all people we the fact that we might see a little bit more of Jadis in the movies um I don't know I just kind of dug we will Yes. Yeah. Stick you... around for my interview with Pollyanna McIntosh. Ooh. She touches on that a little bit. I'm excited. Um, and my loser this week, somewhat predictably so, is Rick. He had like the worst day ever. Mm. And it just yeah, it was a bad looked, day. oh man, like 45 minutes of him just like army crawling in excruciating pain and then hallucinating about dead people and in a cat and then waking up and having to run a little bit and then just, you know, getting shipped off by Jadis. It didn't go as planned. Also, a low-key loser is just medical science in general. I feel like people have died mm. for way less, like than like an entire rebar bar stuck like all like all the way through, like your stomach and back, and then surviving that for like was at least a few hours. They don't do laundry in The Walking Dead on a regular basis. Like you're probably not showering like you used to in pre-apocalypse time. So the, just the chances of infection alone for you getting caught on a rebar that's probably tagged a walker or two Very in high. the last week or so. And then just walking right. around with that in dirty clothes and sweating. And then finally getting dumped into a river with a bunch of other dead people. Like... Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. The, like I don't know what future technology the helicopter people have, but like they absolutely <laughs> injected him with that. Also, like uh, going back to like the rebar wound, um, somebody pointed out on the internet that that's where he gets shot. So oh. like Rick Grimes has plot armor, but he also has a very obvious glowing orange weak spot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and just to pop back to your to your winner on uh, on Jadis Alexandra, mm-hmm. when, when the helicopter comes down. <laughs> <laughs> it's hovering over her and they're like hey we're here at the drop point like what's the deal and she looks over and it pans and she sees rick and she's like oh okay well i've got a b i never had an a like what was jadis's plan in that moment had she not looked over and seen rick's body like um what well, was the next move I, like i okay that's hysterical and i definitely see your point but i i read that as her just trying to get the fuck away and figured she would get them here and then figure it out when they got here but the but she'd only thought as far ahead to get the helicopter there but i don't like i think that would have been funny to see i would like to see um the dailies from the scenes where rick did not wash on shore and Janice is just like two seconds give me two seconds what if he'd washed <laughs> up like a hundred yards down the beach and she's like i have a bee like well where is he well he's can you come with me? He's a little bit further down. He's no serious. I meant to put him there. Like it's all on purpose. Yeah, no, that that's him. He's great. Jadis, that is a mannequin with a gun. You know that. Uh, yeah, that's, he's a B. A's are real people. B's are mannequins. Everybody. No, knows this. Jadis, we've had we've, t- we've had this discussion. Don't do this. All right, we are um, we are bringing back an old segment that we haven't done in quite a while called Ship Watch. I'm going to be shipping. The entire surviving cast of this episode along with their new ptsd with bridges because i don't think this can be unfucked out of their brain watching you know the death the dramatic death of one of the most beloved people in your life uh i think people are just gonna avoid bridges from now on i think that's actually like true because i think when when you go to the time jump the bridge still is out and it's like well we don't we don't touch that bridge that's Rick's oh yeah bridge. we don't we don't go like, that way yeah no we 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 worked on that for a little while. It took us a couple of weeks, but and clearly it held a whole Walker horde. But no, we don't. We just decided the bridge was just gonna be a metaphor. <laughs> Alexandra, 
Who's your ship watch? Uh, I mean, I would Rick and Jadis, man. I didn't see that one coming at all, yeah. but they just ran oh, away yeah. together. <laughs> It's weird. Um, I'm. I, Rick didn't really have a choice. He was kind of kidding. Yeah, I know, right? I will say, like, on all seriousness, I am really curious to see, like, what kind of weird dynamic duo this particular journey turns Rick and Jadis into for the movies, or if, like, she's going to sort of be sidetracked because she is mm. obviously within a different position in the CRM community or whoever the, like, helicopter people. Jadis is probably at a different status level than Rick is. Um, I would like to see, like, their relationship three years from now. Woody, who's your ship watch this week? But first of all, I want to go back because, again, this is the finale episode. Please. No one tells me what to do. There are no fucking rules. You will drag okay. me out of this thing <laughs> kicking and screaming. Uh, to go back to the to the Jadis thing, like, do we – maybe this comes out in the Pollyanna interview, but, like, is she a – do we think she's a recruit or an agent who's, like, dropped on the ground by the helicopter people? Or do they – or have they swung by him and, like, hey, you seem crazy but also competent – uh, would you like to lead these junkyard people and also look for people for us? Um, right. Well, she she can't get too far into the specifics. I think she's like probably like middle management, um, where there's she has a lot of higher ups, but there's also a lot of people below her. I think so. that she. It always seems to me that they like they wanted rec- she formed a community and they wanted recruits, so they went to her. Like it seems like that's the kind of organization they are is to sort of lie in wait and see who's. And just keep an eye on people and kind of see who might be good and then just jump out when they feel like it. That works. Yeah. I was just always curious if she was just yeah. somebody who like the helicopter people essentially like helicoptered her in being like, okay, now go recruit some people. Or if they like f- found her leading groups and they're like, you you seem like you know what you're doing. Can you keep an eye out? Uh, Woody, who was your ship watch this week? My ship watch this week is, is a classic pairing of <laughs> Rick and his horse. Oh, that's oh. a good point. Wait, wait what? Look, he, he sticks by, the horse sticks by in the face of overwhelming odds. And I was so concerned for the horse because every time that they would cut to him, that beautiful white horse, I'd be like, oh my beautiful. God, this horse is fucked up. And be like, oh no, wait, that's Rick's blood. Rick is actually the yeah. one who's in re- really terrible shape. This horse is fine. Uh, and then, <laughs> and you could tell like the horse is like, dude, they are right behind yeah. us. We should go faster. Like, but Rick is in like in terrible, incredible pain and like can't do anything like above a walk. Um, and then I think that this is my stray arrow or one of my stray arrows, but like, did the horse die? I think like, probably did he get God outside the hunting lodge or cabin or did he like scurry oh. off? I mean, you don't see, I can't remember. I think either one appear, either one makes total sense if he just scurried off and then eventually was like brought back into the fold or he's actually who they're going to make the six extra episodes. About. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> it's Rick's horse. It's like a homeward bound type deal. Now we're going to go on to Apocatips. Every week, we give you guys useful advice that you can use in this real-life apocalypse we're pretty much going through right now. Um, they just found aliens the other day, and that was barely a news item. Again, I don't... Just not the year, aliens. Sorry. We can't pay attention to you this year. I kind of touched on this before, but if your friend blows themselves up on a bridge, quote-unquote, and there's a chance they're still alive, I mean, you know, it's very slim, but if there's a chance, just stick around. Don't... Don't slowly walk away with your friends and be like, man, that was tough. Just, you know, stick around. Search around a little bit. Because if they had, I'm pretty sure they would have heard a helicopter. I, I can't. I, my only thought is that the river is running so fast that the sound of the river. Uh, like a babbling brook? It. No, I mean, when you look at it in the episode, like that river is going real fast. <laughs> Guys, helicopters are way louder than rivers. We all know that, okay? Helicopters are loud, loud as shit. And you can hear them from miles away. I, I am not even going to stand for this uh, defense, okay? you They must have been like at least a mile or two miles away to not hear a fucking helicopter that just was there for quite a while, by the way. And at least they would have seen it. You'd think someone would have spotted it, you know? That one I actually have a better defense for because they are surrounded on either side by very tall trees. So from their vantage point, if you assume that the helicopter is like a couple football fields or like a mile away, uh, yeah. I, I can see a world where they wouldn't have been. It's not like it's hovering right above them where like, of course, they would have fucking seen it. I, I think yeah. it's further enough away that like the trees block it out. <laughs> Alexandra, what is your apocalypse? Uh, my apocalypse this week, short and sweet, upper body strength is key in an apocalypse. Oh. So start yes. lifting weights now, guys, because you don't know what you're going to have to pull yourself off of, out of, into, onto. Just fuck, work those arms. Work. I mean, you really need to be in a good, you know, roundabout 360 shape. But this, if this episode teaches you nothing, if it teaches you one thing, let it be that upper body strength is worth And pack at. an extra belt. You never know. Pack two or three you belts. Never you never know. One for a tourniquet. 
One for leverage to pull yourself out of your the rebar that's sticking through your, your liver parts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Woody, what's your apocalypse tip this week? Uh, my apocalypse tip is, is more of an observation. Um, and again, none of these are things to help you. We're, we're not doctors or professionals or anything like that. Wait, these what? Are just observations. Again, none of these are actual tips. You're not or a doctor, help. Johnny. You're, you are out there what on your own, about? listener. Well, then who jo- have I been performing surgeries on? I hope imaginary people and or dolls. It's I don't know. It's gone too far. They were mannequins with guns. Oh, so you oh, so you had a B. Uh, my my apocalypse tip is in, in your darkest hour, uh, when you're really starting to fade and reach the end and you're telling yourself that you need to find your family, your subconscious will uh, conjure for you your worst enemy uh, slash uh, illegitimate baby daddy. And then two other people who you really didn't have like all that much contact with who will tell you to forget about your dead son. <laughs> I, I, I have a real bone to pick with how like having Sasha be at the end there with Rick, like just felt like the, the, they have this whole line where Rick is like, I have to find my family. And he eventually gets to the point of like, oh wait, since all my family's dead except for Judith, the, the people who I like roll with, they are my family now. Not unlike right. Fast and the Furious. But in order to get to that point, wouldn't it have been useful to have somebody from Rick's actual family help him reach that conclusion? Like, I don't know, <laughs> Carl? Like Herschel is kind of an early mentor to Rick in terms of the laying the groundwork of what becomes Rick's moral philosophy effectively and the moral philosophy of the show. And his death is so so significant to Rick, I feel like that like he made he made sense to me, especially given the fact that Shane was already there and you know they were clearly doing more than one most important person. But Sasha was the one that I was really like, I'm not mad at ever seeing Sneakwa Martin Green, but I was just she and Rick were so not like didn't really have a relationship or didn't have much of a relationship. All love to Sonequa. She just, Sasha and Rick did not have any kind of relationship. And that, I, I don't know if she was like the 20th person they called to like be in this episode. I mean, like Abraham would have made more sense, you know? And I feel like Michael Cudlitz was pretty available. Or them as a couple, because, that would have been fun. <laughs> yeah, them as a, Jesus, yeah. I don't know if I can do another Abraham and Sasha like flashback where we see more of them in the flashback than we ever did in the show. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, Lori would have been overkill because we... We, he did that whole thing. Yeah, Carl would have been perfect. There must have been something behind the scenes that happened that we don't know about because I think if they could get Chandler, they would get Chandler. But maybe for some I, reason yeah. they felt it was inappropriate to bring him back for someone else's last episode. Maybe Chandler wasn't really into it at the time. Maybe it was still raw being off the show. I don't know what happened. All right, and that wraps up a pocket tips. Guys, I hope you use all of these pieces of advice. This is our last week of doing it, at least for a really long time. So make sure you collect all these thoughts and use them in real life. Apply them. We are doctors. This is medical advice. Okay. Nope, we are not. Not in any way, shape, or form. So now we're going to go on to our guest this week. She played Jada slash Anne in The Walking Dead, and I had such a great time talking to her. Pollyanna McIntosh. You know, let's stop dicking around and get right to it. Our guest this week is the wonderfully gifted actress, director, and writer who played Jadis on The Walking Dead. You also know her from Darlin, The Woman, Lodge 49, and so many other unforgettable projects. She's also involved with numerous charities like Get Together to Give. Pollyanna McIntosh, welcome to Talk Dead to Me. How are you doing today? Thank you. Great to be here. Um, how am I doing today is such a loaded question these days, isn't it? Right. Yeah, or it's such a, a more tricky of a snapshot. question these days. Uh, a snapshot. Today, I am doing well, thank you. Okay. All right, I swear this is going somewhere. This morning I saw a story where the queen actually knighted this 100-year-old war veteran for raising $40 million for the NHS during you know, oh, COVID-19. Yeah. And it's so lovely. And I was reading that you actually got to perform as Henry VIII in front of the queen <laughs> when you were like nine. What was that like? Yes, uh, now you know you are speaking to a true star. <laughs> yes, yes, you've met the queen. That's, that's like a rite of passage. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, it's funny, my, my school that I was at at the time had its 100th anniversary. Mm-hmm. And so I guess it was a habit that the Queen would visit places that had 100th anniversaries. So she came to Scotland for, uh, to my old school, which was St. George's at the time. Mm-hmm. Been to many, many schools, um, yeah. partly because I traveled around a lot right. as a kid. And, um, and she came to our school and we did a sort of, a sort of, um, what's it called, portmanteau of the, of the, 
plays we've been doing. So we do little bits and scenes for her because obviously the Queen doesn't have all buddy day to spend with, with one school. So I got to be Henry VIII in a, in a momentary scene. And then I shook her hand afterwards, which was Whoa. cool at the time. She was wearing her little white gloves. Um, and of course I had to curtsy. Sure. And I was wearing like these bloomers made from curtains that my mum had made for me, like Henry VIII, this big pantaloony things, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. And I had my little, when I was a kid, I had very blonde hair and I had the same kind of bangs and bob as I seem to like nowadays. Yeah. So I just thought it must, must be quite funny for the queen to be shaking the hand of a little girl dressed up as one of her ancestors. So that's right. kind of funny. You That's know. messed up that you had to curtsy even though you were still dressed as a man, you know? I, feel I like... think it's fucked up that even at nine years old, people were casting me in roles that normally men played. Yeah, that is... is <laughs> were you tall early? Exactly. And it was also okay. an all girl. It was an all girls school. So, How Shakespearean of them. I know, right? So I was... I was um, yeah, I was tall from a young age. So I think I always was given those kinds of roles for that reason. And I think now it's maybe... A similar thing. I think still in our industry, as, as liberal and advanced as Hollywood likes to think of itself, um, I still don't think I would get cast in the role of somebody that was considered vulnerable or, you know, going through, like, like in a horror film, for instance, I'm more often going to be the bad guy than the person being chased. Right. You know, yeah. because I don't fit into the f sort of feminine ideal or the sort of feminine, uh, you know, what's the word for it? Like stereotype. You know, sure. Um, but I, which is, of course, has made my career much more fun and much more me. Right. You know? You've had one of the most interesting backgrounds of anyone I've interviewed so far. Um, you were born in Scotland. You moved around from mm -hmm. Colombia to Portugal to all sorts of places. I'm wondering, like, how that shaped your personality, being such a woman of the world so early on. I think I, I'm sure it shaped me a lot. I think the the biggest thing is probably that. When you lived in countries like that as an outsider, as a foreigner, I think it's really good for, for kids, for anybody to experience a sense of not belonging mm -hmm. or a sense of being the outsider because then you have to be slightly reverential and respectful of what you're entering into. And I feel, and I think it's probably showing, us, showing up a lot for us now, is that part of the problem within the the sort of American culture, if I can use such a broad term. Please. Bearing in mind, this is a country that I love, that I'm a citizen of, that I want to, to be the best it can be. Um, but I think <laughs> you, you would you right, and I think you would be foolish to not see that we're not the best we can be at the moment. And we're going through are, some growing pains right now. We got some big fat growing pains. Um, yeah. And unfortunately we've been growing for a long time. And, but it's good that they're, you know, it's good that there's more exposure of it right now. Let's, let's stick on the positive. Um, sure. But I think that one of the things that's a problem for this country is being such a huge country, a lot of people don't leave it. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But when you've had to travel because you've been taken there as a kid, you have to sort of see things from different people's perspectives a lot more. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you have to learn someone else's language. You have to learn their culture. You have to learn how, you have to see how they work from an outside perspective and not take things for granted as much in your own culture. For instance, in Colombia, you know, we'd be driving along, Colombia, South America, um, we'd be driving along and we'd get to the traffic lights and it'd be, we'd be swarmed by little kids selling oranges, begging for money, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm between the age of five and nine. You yeah. see how lucky you are. You see what you have. You see you're exposed to those who don't have what you have. And me and my sister Tilly, my older sister Tilly, we would like put on plays in the back garden for the neighbors to come and see and we'd make necklaces and sell them door to door and make pictures and sell them door to door and raise money for like the kids so that we could give them Christmas presents and hand oh. those out of the car when they were begging, you know, so that they had Christmas presents. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if that would have, I don't know if I would have had such an understanding of, you know, what it is to have stuff if I hadn't been exposed to that kind of thing. Right. It's easy to fear. And it's <sighs> ironic that we live in a country literally created by immigrants, pretty much, uh, yeah. founded on immigrants. And one of the things that people fear the most is immigrants, yeah. which is really strange. A lot of, I mean, in Europe is set up differently, of course, because 
you know, you're British, but then you've got a bunch of different countries, languages, cultures, ways of doing things just across the sea, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and most people go on at least one summer holiday somewhere outside of their own country when you're living in Europe because you can. You know, it's not that right. I don't get that for Americans to leave and go somewhere it is a lot further away. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not an indictment of Ameri the American people, but I think the American culture can easily get where it's gotten to because and w be one of the factors being that, you know, most citizens or a lot of citizens don't even have a passport. That's true. Yeah. So, uh, Growing up, obviously moved around a lot. I ended back in yeah. um, Scotland and you did some modeling. You did a lot of theater. Eventually, mm -hmm. uh, you moved to Los Angeles. Were you like fearful at all moving to Los Angeles or had you moved so much that it wasn't like a big deal to you? Was it scary okay. moving to LA? Yes. No, it wasn't because I'd moved around so much before anyway. And I actually moved to LA for a relationship. But I will tell you, I was conscious that like I was already in, you know, an actor and but I hadn't been doing it very long in the UK. And I was conscious that if it hadn't been for that relationship I moved for, I wouldn't be sending myself off to LA where everyone's an actor, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm British to boot, you know? And the right. first like 30 people that I sent my headshot and resume at to, as far as looking for representation was concerned, couldn't have given less of a tiny rabbit's shit about me, you know, and didn't answer at all. But it wasn't... Um, it wasn't uh, scary. And I think that's one of the good things that moving around has done for me is that I'm pretty much ready for, okay, it's going to be new and I'm going to be, it's great for being on a set, for instance, you know, when you're working, you're mm. always working with different people as an actor, as sure. a director too, you know, and you're different in different countries or you're in different states. And, you know, it's, um, it's great to have had such a peripatetic past because that means that I can, I'm used to new things and getting, getting involved and not feeling um, too shy or scared, you know? Right. When, <clears throat> when you moved here, was that around the time that the Kardashians got you fired from a restaurant job? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was working at that restaurant after I left my now ex-husband, which is okay. the person I'd moved over to be with. Right. Um, and I was like, right on it like I'm going to need a side job you know to keep myself in finances um and so I started working at this this very fancy restaurant in La La Land which is now closed it was called Il Soleil mm. and it was on Sunset on the Strip and most people were actually very nice that I served in there but these people were not and the reason I got fired is I think because I really let them know that I did not approve of them as I was serving them. I mean, I didn't, I didn't say exactly anything, but I definitely know I had mistressed it up quite a bit and waited till they'd shut up before I read the specials. And I was standing there for quite some time I, because they were looking at that. They were looking, you know, that guy, what's his name? The guy who did girls gone wild and had been sent, to jail for I tried not to memorize his name yeah I, can... I think it's Mark something I feel like anyway it doesn't matter uh, okay it doesn't matter um, I'm not gonna look it was, up <laughs> yeah he was there with them and he was showing them his fabulous new porno which was basically Girls Gone Wild in a magazine great and I was just thinking oh my good god you are looking at porn which was if with this guy who's reputation precedes him I mean, he's just out of jail for abusing these women yeah and, and now, multiple people sued him for mm -hmm. exploitation and now you're all here with him looking at this magazine i mean and one of them the anyway this is like i don't want I, I like the second interview now i'm talking about the freaking kardashians is ridiculous but it, you know it about no, it because it came up when i was i was promoting my film darling at south by southwest it's true. and they asked us random questions like about your worst jobs and stuff and i ended up telling that story and i have no regrets about it but it was just a hugely disrespectful and shitty ass table and i didn't really hold back on sort of being a little bit uh, shall we say regal as I waited for them to stop looking at porn so I could tell them the specials. And I'm pretty sure that that's why I got fired. 
I guess let's uh, might as well hop right into Walking Dead. That is what this sure. podcast is about. Um, so I know you got the role uh, just by auditioning, like a lot of other people. But what's interesting mm-hmm. to me is that the character who wasn't in the comics, Jadis, uh, yeah. also wasn't assigned a gender when you were reading for them. Yeah, I think what was really cool for me about getting seeing that in the breakdown of the character description, of seeing, you know, man or woman it just let me know that these creators were thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. Because if you can play, if you can have a character created that could be played by a man or by a woman, you know that that character is about the character and not about their gender. And it isn't, she wasn't going to be defined by the fact that she was female if a female played her, nor defined by the fact that he was a male if a male played him. So I just thought that's cool, you know? And I think, if anything, if it did anything that, because I think what your question is, is whether, you know, how much I influenced her, partly mm-hmm. because of that. Um, if it changed anything, it probably just gave me a sense of freedom from the off, you know? Right. And, um, and she's a leader. That's who she is, you know? Whether she was to be a man or a woman, she was going to be a leader. And I just liked that they were so open to yeah. possibilities. Was it um, difficult? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was, I was going to overcomplicate the answer, so go for it. Your instincts were right. <laughs> was it difficult to uh, learn the script because she's talking in this, like, backwards caveman language? Or was that, did that make it easier because she was so simple with what she wanted to say? And y- your character kind of said a lot just with your expressions. I think, thanks. I think knowing that she had chosen to speak this way informed how she spoke a lot because Mm -hmm. she's not of another, you know, of another species or of another time or something, which means she speaks that way. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I came up with a few reasons why she speaks that way, which one of which would be to, um, to put outsiders on the back foot. Like it makes you uncomfortable, right? When someone's Mm -hmm. speaking to you that way and you don't know why they're speaking that way. And so it's a great way to kind of, When somebody's a little bit on the back foot, you can take advantage of that and you can see how they are under pressure and you can get a better read of the person. That's not to say me as Pollyanna ever wants to make someone feel on the back foot. That's the opposite of how I approach things. But Jadis, I feel she had good reasons for it. And these were the reasons I came up with that she, to make them uncomfortable so that she could get a good measure of them to make her own group feel like more, uh, bonded because they spoke differently than others and they sort of had their own secrets you know um and thirdly for speed so that if you don't use as many words you know the the information can get over faster and over wide terrain because that junkyard was huge you know yeah was that all Um, built uh just for the set yeah it was super cool and it wasn't obviously as big the the, what you see behind rick's head when you see the helicopter pad and whatnot that's obviously cgi created in a bigger space it's actually shot that set is actually on the lot. And some listeners will know this from having visited the set, because I think you, probably not now, but you can do tours. Yeah. Um, you could do tours before. And um, that set is kind of, you remember when Rick sees the ghost of like uh, Lori mm-hmm. coming across in her white dress? Oh, yeah. And there was the a- same place? That was water, there was water there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That wow. pond is still behind the junkyard. Like oh, it was just gosh. built right there. Um, and it was, uh, designed by the same guy who did the Mad Max, uh, set, oh which makes God. sense, right? The most and recent And it was just, one? yeah. And it was wow. just the coolest thing to walk in to that set and see these piles of cars and, you know, this huge structure. Um, yeah. it was such cool design to me. And it's, and especially since, and I've said this before, but like when I was a kid and I'd be on a road trip with my parents and I'd be looking out the window and I'd see, you know, junk, junkyardy type vibes anywhere. I'd always be like, oh, I could live there because I could make that into my little house and I could do this and I could do that. And I could use that for this and I could make the roof out of that. You know, I just yeah. loved that kind of thinking. And then I was like in a junkyard that was my home. It was like a dream come true. Wow. <laughs> this is like so, made for you. <laughs> totally made for me. Um, I, uh, so no, right. it wasn't hard to, sorry, it wasn't hard to learn the lines because I had all the reasoning in my head for her speaking that way. And so it was just her communication and Mm -hmm. um, it never felt kind of Yodish or silly. It always felt very much 
her choice and and it had it had useful it had purpose so it wasn't difficult it, in fact even in the audition i was just like no this makes sense because she i could tell she was trying to kind of i think there was something in the character description as well in the audition that said she was regal mm. you know and if you can speak to somebody like that acting as if you're above them then which i took you know regal to mean um then uh then you've got a damn good reason for doing it, you know? Right. And it, and it yeah. works. But you also played it with a great sense of humor, you know, the lines about, Thanks. you know, I will lay with him after. And everything. Rick's like slowly backing away, like what? <laughs> he um, loved doing that scene. He was so funny. It was like yeah. the most comedic I'd seen or been a part of on the set at that I've point. I've heard, yeah, now that, he Andy's, now that Andy's left the show, he's become sort of this mythical, you know, sort of mythical figure. beast uh, yeah with everyone and i've heard how sort of method he is and how he listens to music you know before a scene and gets really involved do you have any like memories you know uh working with him like under those circumstances like right before a scene like of him like being like really intense or i don't know because he really like brings 110 uh, percent yeah to the role does he does and 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 seeing that it's not just in how he is prepared to play the character and to be in the moment, but it's in how he um, galvanizes everyone around him. You know, it's mm. not like he stands on set and goes, okay guys, let's do this. It's yeah. more like in his attitude and in his vibe, it all comes down from him, you know, how we, it, it's very important how the number one on a show is. And I don't think you could find a better number one than Andrew Lincoln. Um, mm that music is playing in the trailer. When you come in, he will be singing and dancing. He'll be high and happy with you. You know, he'll be welcoming and fun and he'll be very focused when he's on set, but he's never, he's a true actor. For me, the best, the best, you know, the best fun I can have in my job is in being eye to eye with somebody and mm -hmm. feeling that we're both very much in the moment and we're truly connecting. And Andy is that actor. And so it was always a total delight to work with him. Um, I think maybe method can be misconstrued because it's as if, oh, he's Rick all the time and he's always going to be yeah. looking like he's, you know, really concerned or scared or furious or whatever. He's not like that sure. at all. Um, yeah. But he's, he, he's very aware of, his, of what came before the scene. And because you might be shooting scenes out of, um, out of, uh, t out of you know, in the incorrect timeline, or you might be shooting, you might be doing a pickup for a scene one day, which you haven't shot, which you've shot the rest of four days earlier. Mm -hmm. One thing he does do a lot is he just sort of goes over what's just happened, where he just was, and he might say it or he might just be in that headspace. I think I, I must know because he said it. I must have seen him say it a lot, like the line that came before, even if he shot it days before. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wow. In fact, when we had um, when we had Andy's leaving do. Uh, which was a joy and a delight. And we had lots of surprises, silly surprises for him. One of the things we did was, I think we finished off our sort of cabaret for him by like all of us doing impressions of him just before he shoots a scene. Oh. And we were all like spraying ourselves with water bottles and <laughs> putting our hand in the air and looking at our hand is something he does a lot. Um, and and <laughs> saying what he says and like doing impressions of him. And it was just Girl. really fun. Girl! Coral. Um, coral. <laughs> and, um, oh man. Why hasn't he been used for a campaign to save the corals in the Great Barrier Reef? Oh my gosh, yeah, there's a why lot of ideas. Why isn't like, it just it's... him on his knees just shouting, coral? It sound... <laughs> Where he's and like, where's like, the coral? You guys are destroying your... the ecosystem. <laughs> throw the, your plastic away, listen to Rick. Him and Gail wanted to keep the kids in school in the UK and they achieved that. But like there's a certain amount of years after which it's like for Andy, he said he, he they're at the age where they need their dad around, you know, that they need, right. this is the time. And I know he'd been planning it for a while because in season, it might, he might have gone in season eight. You know, there was, an, there was whispers to me that it might be happening then. Okay. Um, I say whispers because of course no one was supposed to tell me. But right, you know, there yeah. were there were certain things where I was like, oh, oh, anyway, yeah. So he'd been planning it, but he really wanted to get it at the right time. He wanted the st leaving story to be good for the show, for the character. Mm -hmm. He's got so much respect and love for what The Walking Dead is, and the fans, 
Um, and so he wanted to get it right. So it didn't happen then. And then I was like, oh, okay. And then, you know, the next season there I was taken away in this helicopter. Spoiler alert, everyone. Um, so actually... yeah, he, he wanted to go and be a dad and be, you know, present in his kids' lives on a permanent basis. And I'm sure he'll still be working and doing some bits. I know he's doing a lot of charity stuff because he always does. Um, yeah. So, yeah, man, hats off to him. Cowboy hats off to him, literally. Sheriff's hats off to him. I think he did a great job of it. And because You're... he loves the character so much, he wants to, you know, carry on in the movies, which is cool. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, I know you can't say anything. Um, I've seen you in multiple interviews be like, I can't really say anything, but the fans will kill me if I don't ask. So mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> is there any update? Have you, like, without actually giving the update, have you been given any updates on these, you know, planned films or film or however many there are going to be, uh, like, during this time, like, with COVID? Because obviously everything's on pause right now. Yeah, I mean, when I've been having conversations with... Uh... Gimple and Angelo over this time, it's been more sociable stuff, just, you know, mm -hmm. checking in with each other, keeping certain people company. We have a Zoom call. Um, I have had conversations with both of them about, you know, work, but mostly it's been about when the show's going to get back on and, what, you know, how that those plans are going. Um, because I think that's what's probably most present in their mind at the moment, because they've got the responsibility of a, of a huge cast and crew that they love and trying to figure out how to make it safe for them to continue shooting the show. Um, the films I know will happen, but I know that obviously that being halfway through, you know, a series is probably a lot more at the forefront of their priorities right now. I know that they want to get the script absolutely watertight as well. And you know, it'll be when it'll be. I, I'm the same as the fans. I want it to happen like now. Yeah. But yeah, but I it don't. is still happening, right? <laughs> because some people happen. even wonder, people wonder is if it it's still going to, it is happening, right? Well, it's very Hopefully. hard to say, not just, not just like for my, you know, for out of respect for the secrets that the show keeps, but sure. also like just life at the moment. I mean, we just don't know what's what, do we? So no. films that I've been attached to for a while, um, I was told at the beginning of this pandemic, hey, don't worry, we've got the funding, so we're definitely going to do them, but they'll probably happen in, you know, later months. And of course, I knew even then, I was like, they're not going to happen. No. They're, they're, it's just, things change as we go along, you know, so, but these films, the Walking Dead films, I mean, how could you not? They can't, they can't just not do them. Right. It's <clears throat> been too much of a work in progress, and it's too exciting to too many people, and especially to Andy. Andy is, mm -hmm. Andy is thrilled, you know, Andy is committed to this character and to finishing this story. So I would be very surprised if they don't happen. I, I'm very excited, obviously. My only worry is that, um, you know, people will be going to see a film that has already been on, you know, a TV for 10 years. So is it asking audience members to do like 10 seasons worth of research? Or is this hopefully just going to be a, a story where, the Walking Dead fans will really enjoy it. And then newcomers who maybe are not familiar with The Walking Dead at all can also enjoy it without oh, having I'm to sure. like, binge I'm, 10 seasons. I'm sure it'll be a standalone that will work for fans of the show okay. and non-fans of the show alike. Unless, right. unless I'm reading, you know, AMC, Skybound, and everyone I know <laughs> falls yeah. in these things to be way dumber than they are. They don't tell um, me anything. <laughs> um... <laughs> You know, I, I think that they would have to make it accessible for everybody. Otherwise, it would be because it's going to be a big budget thing, and it would be um, it would be a bit of a waste not to include people who have heard of Walking Dead and would love to get involved, but don't want to have watched caught up on ten seasons. You know, you're the first person I've interviewed from the show that is off the show, but didn't get killed off the show. I'm wondering, did you get a death? I there? know. Or Isn't a it amazing. It's so yeah, cool. it's strange. Yeah. <laughs> so cool to me of course i was just imagining you survived one day and then it's like i swear um did i get a death dinner you know i didn't boo for a see you later me. dinner oh. um check you later um i got you know andy was leaving at the same time as me Do, you yeah. know he's the one we wanted to pay tribute to and yeah. at that event he gave me my you know my oh. send-off to bless him 
but That's great. it's quite good because I'm quite I put myself front and center in a lot of ways like I'm not shy you know but at the yeah. same time I don't know if I could have handled a whole dinner about me I think I probably would have just wanted to hide under the table so yeah. it was kind of Maybe cool that you know Andy and I were combined basically um and because it's Andy you know it was it was it was it was just lovely to to give him a proper send off and to get to get send off from him. Right. Um, in fact, it, speaking of being the leaving the show without dying, mm-hmm. I wrote a version of Angie by the Stones for Andy oh. for his for a leaving song that we all sang for him. That's amazing. And at the end of that song, the original song by the Stones, it says, "Ain't it good to be alive?" I think. Is it? Let me check. I check that I'm getting this right. Okay. I know. You'll know but I'm going to do it. <laughs> Please do. I'm doing Stone's Angie lyrics because it was so long ago now that I'm like, you check that this is right. The second last line of that song is, ain't it good to be alive? Mm. And so it inspired a wee, um, a wee lyric change for me, but you know, about him leaving, but isn't it good to, ain't it good to leave alive? You know? Yeah. Because nobody yeah. does. Wow. Yeah. Although now, of course, you know, Lauren went and then she left alive, but she's going to be back. And then I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn now. I'm like, oh, you can't say that. What if that's not true? What if people don't know this? What if you're saying something that they know? Oh, no, 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 no. This whole year was supposed to be all booked out for Walking Dead shows. And it was just going to yeah. be like almost like 52 straight weeks of Walking Dead. Instead, and now it's we just been... got the actual apocalypse. Right. It's been kind of a wild ride. Um, yeah. I mean, as a, as a filmmaker, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a project right now that I'm working on writing that's like easy to shoot at this time. And I think that's probably what's going to happen is a lot more stuff is going to be outdoors, less people, you know, uh, I do, I do think they're going to make up for the fact on, on walkie D as I like to call it on walkie mm-hmm. D as uh, the fact that there's been such a break. I think that they'll shoot more. Um, they're not going to do their regular schedule. They're going to shoot more than they normally would. Yeah. So that'll make up for some that. of that loss, you know, since a lot of the projects you've worked on have involved genre and different kinds of horror. Mm. I just watched Darwin yesterday to prepare oh, cool. for this. I haven't even mentioned it. It's, but I still watched it and I really enjoyed it. It was awesome. Uh, oh, you did good. a fantastic I'm glad. job with that. Thank um, you. Yeah. I was going to ask, I asked this of Michael Cudlitz cause he's also done some directing. I love him. Um, he's fantastic. I want to know how wide the gap is between acting and directing. Um, how much do you have to catch up on or, do you inherently just pick things up as you're acting? And so when you become a director, you kind of already have like a good base. I think that's a really good question. I think it's a question that I want to be very clear on certain points about <laughs> answering. The job of an actor is entirely different from the job of a director. Mm. As an actor, I was always conscious not to assume that I could just step into a director role without, because knowing the incredible amount of work that directors um, study for, for, for a start and then learn on the job and often come up from, you know, positions that lead them up to director. But mm-hmm. as an actor who'd done so many jobs and had watched so much, um, you know, of what the director was doing and, you know, often watching rushes with them and just, just building a lot of relationships with directors because I, I really like a lot of them, you know, mm-hmm. um, and learning from them, I did feel ready I'd also directed theater and I directed a 35 minute short before I wrote and directed uh, Darlin, the film we're talking about. Yeah. So I had had some experience. Um, but I think what's great if you're going to be a director, who's also an actor, the benefits can be that, you know, what it's like being an actor and how you're treated on set. Mm-hmm. You, because you've been in the position of actor with directors, when you're a director dealing, when you're now then a director dealing with actors, you know, especially an experienced actor who's been doing it a while, you know what, what works for you and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the really cool thing is what I really enjoyed with being a director with the actors, with the cast that I had for Darlin, is that, you know, I didn't want anyone to feel like they're being kept in the dark about anything. Didn't want anyone to feel like treated over, over babied, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, because being, you are treated a bit like a kid when you're an actor, like somebody gets you from your trailer and make sure you get to set, you know? Like, yeah. and it's, it's, because, it's because of these things that sets run as well as they do. You know, these are tried and tested things that are happening. I'm not knocking it. But 
also sometimes I feel like a director isn't hearing when I as an actor am, am asking a question, they think it's related to how I'm gonna look on screen, especially for an actress, you know, a female actor, how I'm gonna look on screen that I'm not gonna look cool or I'm not gonna look pretty or I'm not gonna look, it's, whereas often I'm just asking the question because for another reason, like mm -hmm. to maximize the time that they have or to get across the story. And so I think that a lot of directors approach actors like they're sort of big vein babies, you know? Yeah. And um, having had the experience, like I say, of being an actor on so many sets and then directing, I was like, I could speak the actor's language. Often we just want to be told it straight, you know? Yeah. Like Cooper always jokes with me because of course Cooper plays Tony, the, the nurse in Darlin. What a uh, great job. He's so charming in it. He's, oh yeah, he's great, isn't he? He's, yeah. he's, he's great. Did you get him because of Walking Dead or was that a coincidence? Um, I, I knew him because of Walking Dead. I got him because okay. of Walking Dead. Uh, you know, when I'd had the, excuse me, the read through at my apartment in Atlanta when I was preparing, um, you know, when I was in the last drafts of, you know, twiddling with the script in preparation for casting, I had Lauren Cohen was reading our sister Jennifer role that, that um, oh. Nora Jane Noon ended up playing. And I think Avi was the, Avi Nash was playing the bishop. Um, oh, wow. I and, <laughs> That's hard to and imagine. I just, yeah, I know, right. And, um, and so it was just friends that, from the show that, you know, my actor friends who could come over and help me hear it at last. Um, but Coop was just like, oh my God, this role is Cooper, you know? Mm -hmm. This role absolutely is Cooper uh, because he can get all the humor in it. He can be, you can fall in love with him immediately, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and he's really caring, he's really a caring person. And I just thought he'd be great for that kind of father figure role that he, he was in the film. Um, and I also loved that I was casting him to play, you know, one half of a gay couple um, mm -hmm. without making a, without it being like, now oh, here come the gay characters, you know what I mean? It was just yeah. like, these are these guys, you know? Um, right. and, uh, and I just liked that for him too. Um, so again, forgotten the question because I'm now into, in Darling World. Oh yes, because, because, because it's funny, Cooper always jokes, jokes with me on the positive, especially when we're being interviewed together. He's always very sweet and complimentary about my work as a director. But one of the things that he says, which I, I think relates to your question, is like, because I know Cooper well as well, I could say this, but I was like, Coop, you're doing this thing when you're walking, you're kind of walking a bit like this. And I could almost do an impression of him without mm -hmm. it being mean or cruel. But right. I could immediately say to him, you don't need to do that. It's too, you know, it's, this is what you're doing. Like, it's not working. Whereas a director would probably take, you know, would probably go through so many machinations with an actor to find a way to ask him not to do that without insulting him. Like, mm -hmm. we're treated a lot like our egos are very fragile. And in many cases, they are, you know. But it's kind of fun to be an actor-director because you can just be like, you know that thing you do with your arm? Yeah, that thing. Yeah, you're doing that thing. Don't, 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 you don't need to do that. Oh, wow. And not, do you know what I mean? Not be a politician with it. Because yeah. I find on set when somebody's trying to not just tell me what they want mm -hmm. to tell me, I feel empathy for them and I feel their discomfort. And I just want to say, just tell me I'll be fine. You yeah. know? Right. So those elements are good. But also, you know, as an actor, like, you know, how, like, I can, I can really enjoy watching, like, Lauren Canny, for instance, who played the lead in Darla, and she's, like, incredibly emotional and, and keyed in, but she's mm -hmm. also really into story, and she's yeah. also really good technically at, like, maximizing, you know, her performance for where the camera is and stuff like that. So when she, she asks great. questions, yeah, she's great. Right? Where'd you she's find awesome. her? I found How did her you the you, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I, uh, I rabbit long like, hair like yeah <laughs> covered in woods. dirt <laughs> I auditioned her like I did you know a lot of them um and uh uh I should say a lot of them but I didn't ask Nora Jane Noon to audition I didn't ask Brian Bat to audition who played the bishop of course mm -hmm. um and uh, I didn't ask Coop to audition, of course. Uh, right. But but I was auditioning my darlings. I actually had a darling in mind from the beginning that, that was already attached and was great. And I thought, well, that's a relief because it's a really, really hard part to cast. And then she got so, so busy with everything. She was like, can we shoot it in March? And I'm like, no, we've got to shoot it in December because it's got to be November, December. It's got to be when the show ends, but it's got to be before the end of the tax year for the money people. So I was like, yeah. I had this one window, you know, to do. And um, 
I was doing a lot of the prep whilst we were sh still shooting the show, you know, so mm -hmm. I was going to Louisiana to do prep and still shooting the end of Walking Dead um, at the time. And, uh, and Lauren was the first person who came into the audition. I'd looked at a bunch of reels and, you know, pictures. So I had it down to a few people with a great cast and director that we had. Um, and she came in just after me and she was trying to get in the front door and I'd had difficulty getting in the front door as well of the place we were casting. So I was like, hey, it's over here. Are you coming for the da da da? And so we had this little chit chat before we were all in the room together. Wow. And I just thought, just from chatting to her, I was like, this woman is incredible. I love her already. She was like 19 years old, you know? Um, yeah. This girl, I should say. Um, and I hope she's a really great actor because I'd love it to be her because I just had this sense about her and she killed it in the room. And we saw other people too, but you know, because we had them booked already, but I was always about her. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, I took an image of my, my season, um, season eight promo shot of Jadis holding the gun to the camera. Mm -hmm. And I, I photoshopped that. a, yeah, thanks I for having the reference in your head. I photoshopped a picture of her thinking about Lauren as the role, with a picture of Lauren, and I sent it to the producer saying, cast her, or, you know, or else. Wow. <laughs> Using Jadis kind of thing. Like, was, oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, okay, I, I guess sorry, we're cast. I yeah. didn't threaten my producers with yeah. gun violence to cast right. my lead. I just... Yeah. You know, I loved her so much and wanted to do it so much that I did goofy things like that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's great. She's Irish. She's okay. naturally black haired. Really? She was none of the things that I knew. Had, she had to be redheaded. She had to be American mm -hmm. accented at some point. And yeah. instead I got an Irish black haired girl, but I knew she would look great with red hair. And mm -hmm. I just knew she was absolutely the one. And I love, 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 love Lauren. And it was, it's actually a sequel to Woman, right? Yeah, there's this, there's basically Jack Ketchum, great horror novelist, wrote mm -hmm. uh, this book called Offspring, which is where you see the woman character. Right. And we made that movie. I was in that movie. That was um, yeah. directed by the producer who then went on to produce the woman, got Ketchum and McKee together to mm -hmm. make the woman. So Lucky co-wrote it with Jack and... Um, his real name's Dallas, um, and directed it. And then they, the producer came to me and said, I think it was Lucky who suggested me, said, would you like to direct the sequel to The Woman? And I was like, would I like to direct the sequel to The Woman? Yes, but The Woman is an amazing movie. So it's like quite a big thing to take on, you know? Um, and I was like, can I please also write it then? Because if, if, if Dallas, if Jack Ketchum and Lucky McKee are not involved in the writing of it, uh, I, you know, I, I know that world so well, I'd rather be the one writing it because it's, mm -hmm. and if you're going to live with a film, it's going to be personal. So um, I wanted to write it. Um, and now actually the woman wasn't out available to see when Darling came out, which was quite frustrating for a lot of people because yeah. they wanted to watch the woman first. But now it's just been released by Arrow. So you can see the woman. Great. And you can watch Fantastic. Darlin, but I wrote Darlin as a standalone anyway, so that you could appreciate it without having seen the woman or offspring before it. But if somebody wants to watch a, you know, a whole, um, why can't I think of the word which surely begins with tr, a triple, a tr, a tr uh, triple threat, a threequel, a what? Threequel, oh, a, 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 a triptych, a, oh gosh. Uh, useless useless brain of mine can't think of the words um but you know if somebody wants to have like a whole the woman oh trilogy night, they can watch trilogy thank you they I can you. watch they can, thank you mate uh, uh. they can watch offspring <laughs> the woman and then darling or they can start darling and go backwards too yeah well i haven't seen the woman i'm sorry i need to watch it um doing as much research as i can but um now i'm excited it's on arrow so now i'm excited to finally see it yeah, uh, and the other fun thing about Darlin' for Walking Dead fans is that not only do we have Cooper in it, but we also have Sabrina Gennarino and Thomas Francis Murphy, who played Jadis's right and left in the junkyard in the form of Brianna right. Tamiel. They are both in it, and they play a homeless sex worker and a cardinal, respectively. Right. <laughs> the, you know, the classic, so, uh, the classic du film duo. The classic film duo cameos <laughs> for them. Well, yeah. Thomas's is a cameo, Sabrina's more in the film. 
I have a million questions for you, so I hope to have you on again, but that's all I got today. Um, that's all Diana. you got. I mean, I got more, but I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're almost at an hour and a half and, uh, you know, well, I is there we anything you were, you were annoyed to have missed and you're just being polite by missing now? Because... I was going to ask if you had any, oh, well, this is going to be really specific, but it wasn't going to be relevant to anything. I know you and Ross Marquand did this interview. Uh, I think it was either a Spanish language or Portuguese language mm -hmm. uh, it interview was, yeah. where the host was a clown. And in Darwin, yes. you pretty convincingly murder a clown. And I wonder if the two are related. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, I wrote that long before I did that interview. Um, okay. <laughs> he's a very nice man. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it is funny. Um, face to face with a clown when you're being interviewed. I loved the idea of, you know, scary clowns in horror movies and clowns have always scared me. And I wanted sure. to put a flip on that. I wanted to give the horror fan base, you know, as many horror tropes as possible, but with my own take on them. Um, right. And I just couldn't resist when I realized that a lot of it was set in a hospital to have a hospital clown, because that's Might not well. common in a hospital. Um, so yes. Uh, that was just that was just my fun brain, and I I'm terrified of the bastards, so I wanted to kill one. <laughs> Fantastic! Oh, I know, yeah, like it, you know, completely. Uh, that's uh, Peter Skarsgård. He, that, that thing he does with his lip is just terrifying. Oh my god, it's absolutely um, terrifying. And it was you, one of the movies that really influenced my childhood and just scared the bejesus out of me. And actually, the clown in Darlin is played by Jeff Pope, by the way, who was in oh. Happen, Happen Leonard with me. So if anyone's listening and is a Happen Leonard fan, wow. which is a Happen. great show on uh, Sundance. I'll have to check it um, out. Which I think is now available to stream on, I'm sure it's definitely available to stream on AMC, but I think it might mm. also be, be somewhere else. It was on Netflix before. Anyway. Pollyanna, before we wrap, uh, yes. Please tell me about the charity that you are working with right now that involves a lot of our favorite Walking Dead actors. Yeah, thank you for asking. So I just did a campaign um, where people could donate to Doctors Without Borders um, mm. and win a Zoom call with their favorite Walking Dead uh, cast member. So that wow. went really well and it was a great way to connect the fans and everyone was feeling good about giving and those who won were so excited and I'm doing, still wrapping up some of those calls right now. Uh, but it's been wonderful to see the family and to see the fans connecting over Zoom. So I wanted to do another one and get it, you know, keep it going. And I've, so I've started officially calling the charity Get Together to Give. And that's mm. twos in place of the two in there. So get the number two, gather the number two, give. And if you go to my mm. page, Pollyanna McIntosh on Instagram, I've got it all over there as well. But if you could follow that page, I'm going to be... Uh, Oh crap, now we're in on the 26th. Okay, so what I'll say is, thanks for asking. I'm in the middle right now of a campaign that ends on August 20th, so people still have plenty of time to take part. And they will be donating to the Loveland Foundation, which provides free therapy for black women and girls of all ages. And when they donate, they will get the chance to enter to win a Zoom video call with their favorite Walking Dead cast members. And we've got lots wow. of great people involved. Norman Reedus, for instance, is obviously a big draw. Um, and if you go on to Get Together to Give's Instagram page, you will uh, see how to take part and be one mm -hmm. of, get a chance to win, but also get a chance to feel good by donating to a great cause. Wow, that's phenomenal. Um, that's really inspiring that you're doing that. And, you know, you're, it seems like you're a really fantastic advocate for a lot of amazing organizations. So um, thank you. Well, I couldn't do it if it wasn't such a great cast family and who were so willing to give their time. And if the fan base wasn't such a generous and uh, loving one, you know, um, I really feel so lucky and honored to be part of this show and to be part of such a wider community. And it's been great to see how that can be used for good. So I'm hoping to pass it on to other casts and keep it moving and just keep raising money every month um, and getting the fans involved. Using your platform for good during quarantine. You love to see it. Pollyanna McIntosh, thank you so much for talking to me. Hope we get thank to do it you, again. Thank you, Johnny. And yeah, uh, that'd it's, be great. it's honestly been really fun talking to you. So uh, thank you, enjoy. Thank you. And yes. next time I might even show my face. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 teaser next at 11. Yeah, All right. Well, teaser. Um, 
thank you so much, Pollyanna. Have a great uh, rest of your day and enjoy, you know, your dogs, enjoy them barking at things, let them bark, let them protect you. <laughs> you know, you're going to need them when the, when the shit hits the fan even harder. So <laughs> yeah, you know? man. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I've, I've got, thank you. got a pit bull in the back too. So we're ready. Oh my God. Yeah, you're ready. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Pollyanna. All right. Lots of love. Bye. All right. Bye. And that wraps up my interview with Pollyanna McIntosh. Hope you guys enjoyed listening to it. I had a great time. What you guys didn't hear from that interview is that uh, my dog Goku went absolutely ballistic like 20 times uh, during that interview, <laughs> and we had to keep pausing. But that's that's just showbiz, baby. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are going to end this amazing, amazing, thorough podcast with stray arrows. These are some extra things that we noticed about the episode that didn't make it into another segment, but we're going to bitch about them here anyway. So don't think we didn't forget. Um, I'm going to start us off. This one, actually, I'm not complaining about anything. A surprise. Um, That's my job. Yeah. Uh, this was actually Scott Wilson's uh, final project that he worked on before he passed in 2018, which is really sad. I remember watching this episode before he died and feeling a really certain way. And then I remember being there at New York Comic Con while they were doing the Walking Dead panel. And he literally, the news of him passing came out like the second we oh, all got out. Right. And it was really sad. And watching that episode again, now that he's passed, it has so much more emotional weight because they really cast him in this sort of mm -hmm. heavenly light where it's almost like he is speaking yeah. behind i mean i know that was like the role that he's speaking beyond the grave to rick but you know now that he's actually passed it like adds so much more weight to it so it's a lot more impactful it of a really scene. does and it has now become like you know the shane stuff was great but it's my favorite part of the episode I think deservedly so, too, in a lot of ways, just because Scott Wilson seemed to be a genuinely lovely, kind person to everyone. Like, there's just, and I feel like there's plenty of footage to show that in interviews and other IRL stuff. That, and like, I think the reactions of the Walking Dead cast were incredibly genuine as well. It was just, it was a sad thing. And this felt like kind of an, a, a near perfect homage on The Walking Dead to Scott Wilson, from The Walking Dead to Scott Wilson. Uh, one final thing, holding in the secret that they were doing a massive time jump that includes a much older Judith and then Magna and Luke and Yumiko and all them was very difficult. And it was so delightful to get to be in the audience with everyone as they got to see the big Judith reveal at the end, which we oh, haven't even God. touched on yet. And just everyone lose their fucking mind. And uh, it just really ushers in a new era of The Walking Dead. I liked the um, the balls of that, or just like the chutzpah of that, and of that choice at the end. Like, not yeah. of, like we're not going to give people a minute to mourn Rick. Rick's alive. You're going to get movies. Yes, there's a lot of change. We're not going to focus on just this. We're not going to focus on you know everybody getting over their Rick grief. They're going to get over it and survive because that's what they do. Right. And here's where we're going to start again. All in the last. Like, I remember like yeah, watching that and being like, wait, it doesn't end with him being carried away in a fucking helicopter. What else could possibly be left? Oh. It's a great choice to to uh, speed it up six years and be like, yeah, just like you said, Alexander, like don't have two episodes of Morning Rick and like searching the river and all that stuff. Like just jump ahead in time and mm -hmm. let's just like get on with it. That was great. My, my one thing that I thought was at in time uh, after the third rewatching of this episode, I do I would have loved to have seen that final bumper extended by like one more minute where Judith picks up her hat off the ground and says, Judith, Judith Grimes. And then all of the characters who just, or uh, all the characters looking at her being like, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm Eleanor. Uh, here's my, <laughs> here's my last name. This is Luke. Here's his last name. I didn't realize we were doing formal stuff, but uh, yeah, yeah you're, you're all of our formal. <laughs> like, are you, are you like, Judith Grimes? I know, I like how she's like Judith and they're like, yeah. And they're like, Judith Grimes. And everyone's like, oh shit. Oh shit. Like, oh, that was shit. literally like just a line for the audience, you know? It's a little bit like Ray, Ray Skywalker. And the person's like, and that means exactly what the fuck to me. Like, yeah. She's like. And do you, do you live yeah. here? Uh, no, I'm just here to bury some lightsabers. Uh, don't tell anybody where I put these. Woody, what are your stray arrows? Uh, my first stray arrow is a question. Uh, Johnny, what's your wound? My wound is um, the 2015, 17, and 18 uh, Golden State Warriors. Um, that is my wound. <laughs> I love that. That's that. <laughs> I did not think that you were going to do such a great job with that. That was that was perfect. It, it is uh, a raw wound, and there. I will never recover. Alexandra, what's your wound? The fact that Comic-Con hasn't done any virtual passes up until now. 
Love it. Yes. That's excellent. Fantastic job, crew. Wait, Woody, what's, what the hell is your wound? I made a, a series called uh, NPC for Machinima that was about a guy who realizes he's a non-playable character in Grand Theft Auto. And people were like, oh, you should make that a movie. And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. It's a web series. And then uh, <laughs> stay tuned for Free Guy starring Ryan Reynolds that comes out December 11th on, in theaters, maybe. Oh, my God. Aww. that's didn't It's your whole fucking idea, one. huh? My, my second stray arrow, and I don't actually know this. The internet told me, and I'm just telling you listeners, and I assume that you know this already. Um, Jadis's RV at the beginning uh, is Heath's RV. Yes, I knew that. So, you know, take that take that as you will. Is Heath somewhere in helicopter person land? Yes. Maybe. Maybe he's dead. Maybe the six episodes after season 10 are just about what the shit happened to Heath. Get my final it. stray arrow is, is uh, just a personal story. Um, this episode... Uh, or like news of this episode came like around the time that I was starting at Skybound as a full-time employee. Mm-hmm. And uh, Johnny, you and I were on the second floor together and I was across the, the way from you in the cubicles when you were Johnny Hot Takes. Uh, I'm still Johnny Hot Takes. And, How dare you? you see, it's 100% still Johnny Hot Takes. <laughs> and we had people in the third floor constantly complaining that we were too loud because we would just shout back and forth at each other about like, what the fuckery. Um, and I remember the news broke that Andrew Lincoln was going to be off the show and you were like, what is going to happen? Is there still going to be a walking dead? Like we, we just started to turn this corner. What the hell is happening? Uh, and there was all of this, like a general, like uneasiness or like uncertainty and anxiety about like, where was the show going to go? Uh, and then, you know, they found this solution there, there will be the movies at some point after we are all dead. Um, (laughs) and it was just a, like, and I remember you like keeping that shit under wraps, but you would have like the dailies at your laptop and I'd be like, well, what the fuck's going on? Like, what are they going to do? How is it happening? And you're like, oh, it's big. <laughs> and then you wouldn't tell me. You may or may not have told me some plot details under uh, NDA and like DEF CON 4 uh, security levels. Yeah. But uh, but I, I remember those I remember those days fondly. Aww, and that was one of my first little uh, Skybound memories. Oh, that's so. nice. Alexandra. What are your stray arrows? This episode, and this is from somebody who doesn't play any video games whatsoever. Um, this episode played to me like a video game. Like every single yes, time. Yeah. I love this take. Okay. I love this take. I thought it was Woody's at first. Um, <laughs> this is a fantastic take. It's just, well, like, I mean, he just, he's like, he's got to do something. Okay, I've like, got to get off this rebar. They're, the herd's approaching and we spend 10 minutes on that and it's excruciating. Then he does, he gets on the horse and then the horse gets scared and then he's just got to make it to the cabin and then the cow, he's got to rest there and got to just, oh, now he's got to get to this bridge. And it's just the successively more difficult challenges. Down to the moment where, like, when he gets to the bridge and the walker like conveniently knocks over the box of dynamite and the explosives are labeled red that are very clear yeah. for you to shoot. Like that is like classic video game stuff. And he's like, oh, I get it right there. The other side of me, the English major side of me also felt like this was instead of Wizard of Oz, Dante's Inferno. Um, Cause he's Ooh. bouncing through, he's going through several levels of hell to get to <laughs> To get some kind of, some kind of, I mean, really, honestly, it's just, it's to get to safety and his subconscious is just playing tricks on him because there's so much blood loss. That's really good. I like that. And it's, it's, again, Alexandra, it is far too smart commentary for this uh, music <laughs> podcast, but I really do <laughs> appreciate that. Anytime we can, you know, summon Dumas. Is it Dumas? Uh, do I da- get that right? Dante. Dante. Literally, name, name in the title. Dante Alighieri. No, I mean, like, who, who, who made, who wrote Dante's Inferno? Oh, dear. Dante. Oh, <laughs> like four hundred years, like a couple hundred, like oh. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it was like a book. I don't know, guys. I don't know. It's, it's a book. I, what, it is a book. Do you guys see what I said? Do you guys see what I said? Is that this is too far too smart, and I, this is all getting taken. No, out, if so you cut like this out, I no. swear to God, it's. I what are you gonna do? You. What are you gonna do? End the I podcast? Will... What are you gonna do? I will edit this out. I will find the source files, and I will edit this outtake, and I will put it up online. I swear to God, if you don't include, hey, who wrote Dante's Inferno? I, I am. I'll find this, Johnny. I'll find this, and I'll publish it. It's too good a okay. bit. Right. It went on for the perfect amount of time. No one, no one uh, is listening at this point. We have gone on now for this podcast is roughly three and a half hours. Like nobody yeah, is sure. still <laughs> listening to this. Let's see. He did the Count of Monte Cristo, Alexandra Dumas. Um, three so, you years, know, couple hundred years after Dante, different country. I was four hundred years old. <laughs> and that wraps up this week's episode of Talk Dead to Me, guys. This is emotional, just like Rick getting blown up on that bridge. But listen, the bridge 
is going to be fine. The bridge is the pod. Wait, that's, that's not a good analogy because the bridge blows up. Um, you know, this podcast is Rick being taken away in a helicopter to to other places. You know, it's going to be a new environment. Can someone else help me with this? Yeah, metaphor? so here's here's my, my take on it. <laughs> uh, Johnny, for for the last 38 weeks or so, uh, we have we have gone on a journey together. We've accumulated uh, followers and communities. We've made some enemies. Uh, and then at the end, we find ourselves stuck through our liver with some rebar. And we're just trying to, to make our way through it. And we're wondering, like, can we find our family? And you know what? They've been here in this podcast with us the whole time. It took some what? versions of our subconscious to be here. And now, as we face the end and the final happy birthday, Nate, as we point our metaphorical revolvers at the, at the dynamite, we whisper finally, I found them, and so it ends. Wow. That was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. It's been a journey. Thanks, and you're completely Woody. right. Yeah, and at the end, I just want to do one last thing where uh, listener and or viewer, we make a lot of jokes about how we would like to become Commonwealth stormtroopers when they inevitably put the Commonwealth into the TV show. So if we can make that Twitter thing happen with Angela Kang, let's make it happen. We would look great let's in white and red. I don't think I'm tall enough, but I think, you know, I could be like an assistant, like an intern to the Commonwealth. Wait, are you saying that you're a little short for a stormtrooper? I I am. Excellent. (laughs) All right, guys, we, I will continue uh, this podcast in interview form uh, from here on out starting next Sunday. Um, Like I said, expect to hear, I mean, Woody and Alexander, would you be down to at some point maybe pop in for, for a few words? Only for the finale. Great. Finale. No, this thing is going to go on toward dead, <laughs> which could be in six weeks. Who knows? And then undead, it and then could dead be again. In six weeks. Yeah. All right. As always, I am going to find the original Nate voicemail and play it right here. I don't have it with me right now, but it will be played over this. <laughs> so let's listen to it one last time. And before we do, happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. Next up is Nate. If. I had to choose a villain group to join with, I would probably go with the saviors because all you have to do is just like work. <laughs> God, I'm way too fucking high for this right now. I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> all, you, <laughs> all you have to do is work and keep your mouth shut and you'll get by. I mean, like it's a little bit more tricky if you decide to join Negan's militia, you know, if you decide to be a soldier and fight with him, that's a little bit different. But um, if you're just like one of the worker people, you know, they were in a community, all they were doing was doing their job and surviving. And that's pretty much how all of us are living right now, doing our jobs to survive. So yeah, uh, sanctuary would be the easiest, uh, you know, Negan's group would be the easiest to join. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, my name's Nate, and I'm from Chicago. <laughs> Hell, yeah. Uh, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>